Okay, my friends, thank you very much for being here tonight. This training session will cover the San Lorenzo River and the larger San Lorenzo River watershed. Thank you very much for being here. We are joined tonight by Carly Blanchard, who is the Environmental Programs Manager with the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And we are all very fortunate to have her speaking to us tonight. So if you will please join me in giving her your undivided attention. Um, we'll have opportunity for Q&A at the end. So thank you in advance. Carly, whenever you are ready, take it away. Great, thank you, Dylan. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Make sure that comes to the full screen version. Okay, can everyone see that? Great. All right, well, thank you, Dylan, for having me. And thank you for the rest of the group for letting me talk on the San Lorenzo River watershed. Um, as Dylan mentioned, my name is Carly Blanchard and I work for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District as their Environmental Programs Manager. Um, today, just as a quick overview, we'll kind of talk about what a watershed is, um, what the specifics of the San Lorenzo River watershed are, kind of just a quick overview, um, where water moves through the watershed, as well as an overview of my agency, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, it should be relatively short this presentation. So I think we'll spend quite a few, most of the time on questions and answers. So hopefully the group has some good questions. Um, let's go ahead and jump in. So really the fundamental question is, and we'll probably a lot of you already know this, I'm um, being docents, but what is a watershed? So this is a definition I pulled from the internet, but I think it captures the idea really well. So a watershed is an area of land that drains or sheds water into a specific water body. Um, every body of water has a watershed, and watersheds drain rainfall or snow melt into streams and rivers. Um, it begins at the headwaters or the top of the watershed and then ends at the mouth of the watershed or the bottom of it. Uh, the steep hillsides act as a funnel flowing all that water down into the main stem or the middle of the watershed. And the watershed also acts like a sponge or a filter before the water actually reaches the, the smaller streams or the main stem river. Um, there's a really nice graphic that I pulled as well on the right hand side. Um, you can see at the top, which would be the headwaters of the watershed shows there's either snowpack or rainfall coming down. Um, you can see that there's hillsides kind of directing that water into the smaller streams or the main stem river through the middle. Uh, those smaller streams we usually refer to as tributaries, uh, which is outlined in that graphic as well. And then there's also sub-basins or smaller watersheds within the larger watershed, and those are made up by the different tributaries. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on from that. Um, so now we can dive into a little more specifics about our own watershed, uh, which is the San Lorenzo River watershed, or I might refer to it as the SLR watershed, just to make it a little simpler. Um, but the watershed's about 138 square mile area. Uh, the main cities or the main towns um, that I'll call out are Santa Cruz, Boulder Creek, Ben Lomond, Felton, and Scotts Valley that sit within the watershed. Uh, the headwaters start near Castle Rock State Park at an elevation of 2,500 feet. And then the mouth ends in the Pacific Ocean. The watershed supports over 100,000 people uh, for their drinking water. And that's not to mention the ecosystems and other organisms that live within the watershed and rely on it as well. On the right hand side, we have a really nice depiction of the watershed and its boundaries. Um, you can see in blue are all the water bodies within the watershed and then the black shows the actual boundaries of the watershed itself. Um, and this map was developed by the city of Santa Cruz um, for the Water Resources Control Board. So at the bottom, you can see their jurisdiction uh, towards the river mouth or towards the mouth of the watershed. So this is a question I'll pose back to the group. Um, and Dylan, I don't know if we can unmute or if you, we do raising hands, but you know, where does the water come from for the watershed, right? Um, we're very lucky here that we have our own water as supply and we don't have to rely on outside sources. So where would someone's guess as to where it comes from? Where do you already know? Anyone want to volunteer? Precipitation. 
That's correct. Thank you, Gary. Exactly. So it's rainfall. Our water really comes from rainfall. Um, if you think back to that graphic, right, where it showed the snow pack or snow melt that feeds the watershed, we really don't have that here, right? We have very limited snow and never really snowpack, and we don't get any of our water from the Sierras like many of the other counties in the state do. Uh, so we re solely rely on that rainfall. Um, in our watershed, our annual rainfall varies between 15 inches to more than 100 inches, um, and that really depends on the location or the year that we're in. Uh, for an example, Boulder Creek averages about 47 inches annually, and that uh, data actually is all collected by the county of Santa Cruz. Um, so on their website, you can find all the annual water data uh, throughout many years. And then the San Lorenzo Valley Water District also has its own rain gauges. And we do have all that information on our website as well. And I'm happy to send any of those links if anyone wants them or can't find them for some reason. Um, you're more than welcome to contact me. Um, and I did mention this, but it's, it's really important to realize that we are very lucky that we have a watershed that we can rely on for our own water. Um, you know, a lot of other counties in our state do rely on outside imported water. Uh, very interestingly, you know, the more southern parts of our state do rely on the Colorado River for a lot of their water. Um, so that's a watershed completely in another state, multiple states over. Um, and that's just kind of a crazy thing that's developed down there and for a few other southern states. So we are lucky that we have a watershed that can support our population. So there are many ways that water does move through the watershed. Oh, sorry. I have a, a puppy that found his squeaky toy. <laughs> um, but there's, there's many ways that water can move through a watershed, uh, but I'll focus on three main ones. And that's water flowing through the system and out the river's mouth into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we then also can consider diverting or pumping water for actual public water supply or irrigation. And then water can also flow into the ground and uh, enter into the groundwater basin. So to begin, uh, water flows from the headwaters down into the ocean. Um, a few years ago, you might remember there was a lot of talk by our then president about how much water we were wasting by letting it flow into the ocean. Um, that really kind of doesn't look at all the factors that allowing that water to have this cycle and flow through the ecosystem um, supports. So it supports the water cycle, sediment movement, supports ecosystems and species, it transports nutrients throughout the system, as well as moves pollution out of the system. Um, the natural flow in a watershed from the headwaters to the sea provides sediment transport. And without that transport, we'd have buildup of sediments causing issues for homeowners and changes to the watershed and how it functions. Um, we'd also see likely losses of beaches. So by not having that sediment moved down, we could actually see that, that decrease the beach, um, which would be a very large problem for our county in particular. So water supply is another way that water's moved in and out of the system, right? Um, we have quite a few different water users within the watershed itself. There's private well owners, there's small water mutuals, and then there's the larger utilities that include Santa Cruz City, uh, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, and Scotts Valley Water District. Um, on average, the watershed actually produces about 29 billion gallons annually. And our larger utilities, uh, the three I just named, use about 5 billion gallons each year. Um, the water is either diverted from the streams or pumped from our groundwater basins. Um, and on this right-hand side, this is an example of one of our raw water diversion sites. Um, you can see there's a V-notch weir, which is that wood structure, and then the water flows or is directed into that pipeline and then back into our treatment plant for treatment. Um, unfortunately, this particular diversion was lost in the 2020 CZU fires. Um, we actually had about 86,000 acres burn in that fire in the watershed. And I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more, maybe when we get into questions and answers. Um, 
Then the next important thing would be groundwater, right? So our watershed's actually feeding into our groundwater basin. And groundwater is the water found within the pore spaces of the geological material beneath the surface of the earth. So what that means is it's not really a lake or a, a big body of water underneath us. It's actually water finding these small areas in between sediments and rocks to form and kind of fill in. Um, the groundwater is recharged by rain or snow seeping into the ground, and we call that recharge areas. Um, this graphic on the right actually shows or kind of depicts these different features within the watershed and the basin's interaction. Um, the discharge areas are places where the groundwater reaches the surface and then discharges into the stream, um, lake, or wetland. And then another really important term um, of, between the interaction of groundwater and surface water, um, and surface water refers to our streams or rivers, is gaining or losing water from streams. So there's a gaining stream or a losing stream. And the main difference between the two is that one obviously loses water into the ground and one brings water from the ground into the streams. Uh, both of these interactions refer to that interaction. And then the gaining and losing can vary based on locations in the watershed, the time of the year, and other geological factors. Um, just as a side note, uh, you know, depicted here in this graphic as well is a well um, where we pump water from. In our agency's jurisdiction, we have wells that range anywhere from 200 to 700 feet deep. And then this is kind of a giveaway. I was going to pose this question to the group, but what species does the root watershed support, right? Um, this is one of my favorite species, the uh, Pacific lamprey. He, these, these species have a super interesting life history, um, kind of similar to salmon, where they'll move from freshwater um, to saltwater. And actually, when they hit the ocean or get into the salt water, they become parasitic, which is very interesting to me. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to raise their hand and say a species that they're fond of or maybe that they've seen in the watershed, um, but I'd love to hear from the group. Trout. Yep. We have coho and steelhead here, which is really great. Ducks. Yep, ducks. Mm -hmm. My youngest daughter was really fond of finding lamprey eels in the sandy edges of the stem around the river. We lived right on the river for 25 years. Nice. Yeah, they're really fun to look at. <laughs> they're pretty strange. <laughs> okay, so you guys named quite a few of them, um, but I'll still pull up my list. Uh, there's obviously the fish species that were mentioned, um, but obviously this list isn't all inclusive, but we have steelhead coho, lamprey, uh, tidewater gobies. Uh, it supports birds, amphibians, plants, and of course people. Um, the watershed actually supports about 122 different species of birds, and they use the watershed for foraging, roosting, and nesting. Um, another really interesting thing about our watershed is we're the most southern um, watershed that su still supports coho salmon. Um, we also have steelhead salmon. So those two species of, are really of interest to a lot of our regulatory agencies like um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the National Marine Fisheries uh, Service. So you know we have a lot of different regulations around protecting those species. And then as a quick overview about my own agency, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, um, probably a lot of you are customers if you live within the water basin, um, but we were established in 1941 and we're kind of made up of a bunch of different consolidations of smaller water mutuals around us, um, which makes our system very complex. We now serve about 26,000 customers in the watershed. And we do conjunctive use, which means we have two different sources of water, both groundwater and surface water. And on an average year, we use about 60% surface water and 40% groundwater. Um, there are 36 different pressure zones. Um, like we talked about, the watershed tends to be very uh, sloped and steep to direct that water downwards. So by having all these homes up in those steep slopes, we do have to pump water up. 
Um, so that makes the system pretty complex as well. And then our agency does manage about 2,200 acres of watershed land. And in that 2020 season U fire, we did have about 1,600 acres burned. Um, so that's been a huge impact to our agency as well as just the watershed overall. And then I have one more slide uh, that just depicts uh, the watershed again uh, with the San Lorenzo Valley Water District's uh, jurisdiction and some of our land. So you can see in the darker blue, the boundary of the watershed itself. Um, and then in the lighter green, that depicts the actual jurisdiction of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And that darker green uh, areas are our different watershed properties. So the largest one is the Ben Loman Mountain uh, property. The next one down is the Felton property. We own uh, some property as well in Olympia watershed and then Zianti. Um, the other things depicted here on this map are the different stream types. So there's perennial streams, which are pretty much always flowing, and then intermittent streams, which are usually different times of the year, either flowing or not, depending on the rainfall. Um, and then there's also some roadways located here, and then all our wells and diversion sites. So any of the diversions that were located in the Ben Loman Mountain property, the largest property we did lose in the CZU complex fires. Um, and we also had some burn in the Felton area, but didn't lose any infrastructure for water diversions. Um, so that leads us to the question portion. Um, and I'm happy to share this presentation or maybe Dylan wants to send it out to the group but my contact information is here if you want to write it down and send me anything uh, there, or we can talk through questions here as well. Thank you.